Well, good evening, and I have quite a treat for myself. Uh, Susan Vincent is one of my oldest, dearest friends. Uh, she is so well, she knows so much about reading recovery. Uh, I, I think at LitCon, she said she's presented at, I don't know, how, she'll tell us, uh, just tons of times at LitCon. Uh, and she's uh, the one that made me aware of what LitCon and all that. Uh, and she has a remarkable background uh, in reading, and uh, she's now teaching at a university. So uh, I'm going to be quiet at this point and say, hey, tell us all about yourself. Here we go. It's all you. Hi, Dr. Sam. First, I want to say thank you so much for inviting me to talk with you tonight because you're one of my favorites at LitCon. I don't ever want to miss your session. Um, thank you. Thank you. But in your kind introduction, I think what you were getting to was the fact that I'm old and I've been around a long well, time. Hey, I'm older than you, so there. <laughs> okay, go ahead. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I've been in this field for over 30 years. When I hit 30 years, I quit counting. So I know I'm over 30 years, but not sure exactly how many. But it's been a long time. Um, and I've kind of come full circle. So you said I teach at a university, but I actually teach at the university where I got my undergraduate degree and got my license to teach. So I'm back to right where I started. That is so cool. It, it's wonderful, which is Miami University in Oxford, Ohio. So that's where I am right now. Um, and then my background, you said, you know, I was in reading recovery, which I was. But I was a first grade teacher before that. And then I was a read and recovery teacher for seven years. And then I was a read and recovery teacher leader where I trained other teachers for 12 years. So read and recovery was a big part of my career. And then I was a literacy coach um, and things like that afterwards. And then about, I think, six or seven years ago, I came back to Miami as a faculty member. So now I'm teaching in the teacher ed department. So I've come full circle. Wow. So that's really quite the background. Um, let's get into things here. Uh, uh, when I saw you uh, right after your uh, session at LitCon, uh, the first thing I did was walk up. Would you let me interview you about what you just said? Because uh, that was a, an amazing session. So uh, I'm absolutely, totally enthralled with uh, all the things you had to say there. So what I'd like to know now is how did you get interested in all this? Can you tell us a little bit about the research uh, uh, in decodables and predictables? And um, um, you might even do a little screen share of some slides or whatever. But uh, sure. tell, tell us all yeah. you got interested and in, tell us about the, all this research. Well, I'll start this by saying I myself am not a researcher in any way, shape or form. So I'm not a researcher. I'm a practitioner, but I'm always interested in the research because I want my teaching to be research based. So what I was finding, I'm in Ohio and Ohio has just passed some literacy laws and those laws kind of dictate the kinds of books that we use to teach children how to read. Um, and they're, you know, they say decodables. So as a result of that, several of the districts around me are dumping all their books, all their leveled books, the books in their book rooms, like everything they've got, they are getting rid of to bring in decodables. And so that got me interested in well, what, like what even is a decodable? Do we have a definitive definition of what that is versus a leveled book um, versus a predictable book? What does that even mean? What does the research actually tell us? I really wanted to know. And the other thing about it that I think is so important to me, the most important part of teaching kids to read is the book we choose to put in front of them to use as instructional text. Because, you know, if you think about it, whatever your philosophy or theory of reading is as a teacher will influence the books that you choose to put in front of your children. So if you're a very, very code oriented teacher, you are, of course, going to look for books that are very code oriented. And if you're a very meaning oriented teacher, and that's your philosophy, you will probably look for books that are very heavy on meaning. And so what we put in front of children 
gives them a message about what reading is and what literacy is. So I think it's really, really important. I don't think it's just an afterthought of, you know, I'm just going to go grab a book or I'll put whatever book the program has me using in front of children. I think it really, really matters and we need to think about it a lot. So that's kind of how I got interested in thinking I need to do some reading and find out what the research really says, um, because I want to know what the right books are to put in front of children. So that's kind of how I um, chose my topic to present on at LitCon, not because I do the research, but just because I'm interested in what the research says. Okay, um, so you were going to show some slides, I hope. Um... Yeah, so what I'm doing, I have slides that are kind of taken from the LitCon presentation that I did. I'm not showing you all of them, but I'm just going to show you some of them. So what I have here is just a list, and these are links. So Sam, you'll have these links if you want to put them in the blog, of some of the research articles that I read. Some of them are kind of heavy duty research articles, and some of them are just easy to read blogs that reference research. So that's what I'm gonna kind of talk about. And what I'd like to do is just share a few of these and what my big takeaways were from reading these. Okay. So the and first you, one I'm oh, gonna- okay. Oh, before you move on, yep. uh, I'm gonna say uh, there will be, a, every one of those that just showed on that slide will be a link in the blog entry itself, okay? okay. So readers, uh, our, our listeners of the blog, it'll be there. Okay, go go for it. All right, awesome. So the first one comes from Reading Research Quarterly, which is from ILA, um, and it's a heavy research article, um, and it's called Pex Types and Their Relation to Efficacy and Beginning Reading Interventions. But the big takeaway for me from that research article is, was this little section where they talked about studies on children who um, were given both decodable books and non-decodable books. So they got both. And the effect size was the largest for the group of kids who read both kinds of books, as opposed to kids who just got decodables or just got non-decodables. And so they say in this article, they suggest down here at the bottom, that there are benefits to using multiple types of text. So that's my first like, aha, maybe we need to not be having wars about decodables levels. Maybe we need a variety of types of text. So that's what this article talked about. Okay. Then this next one- I'll, I'll put a, a little plug in here for reading research quarterly. It's one of the, I have a lot of friends, I, I'm not a researcher myself either, I have a lot of friends that are, and for all my friends who are, getting an article into reading research quarterly is a huge deal. It's like a career maker. So it is, it, it is the uh, the best of the best of the best in terms of research journals. And uh, uh, so this is really powerful uh, research that you just talked about. Yeah. Just a little plug for research quarterly. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All yours. The next one is kind of near and dear to my heart. Um, it's out of the University of Newcastle in Australia. And it's near and dear to my heart because through the magic of Twitter and online communities, I've interacted with Rachel Burt, the author there, and Denise Ritchie. And I know you have too, Sam. Yes. And so they're two of the authors of this and it's a lit review. And it's, I would recommend, it's long, but man, I recommend this article to anybody who's interested in what kind of books we should use to teach children how to read, read this article. Um, so I'm pulling out and I, I copy and pasted this from their um, article. So these were some of the big takeaways that they said, these weren't all of them, but they're ones that kind of really matter to me. And they echo what Reading Research Quarterly, that article said. One is that we should use a variety of texts and you can see all the references here. And not only is it good to use a variety of text, it's detrimental to only use one kind of text. So that got my notice as well, since I know a lot of schools that are moving to only one type of text. Um, Another big takeaway was that the books that we choose 
you need to be looking for more than one feature. And a feature is something like the phonics principles. That's one feature. But another feature might be, is it engaging? Another feature might be, does it use natural language like children use to talk? Those are all different features that we look at when we're selecting books. And we need to, this article says, we need to look at multiple features, not just looking at what phonic skills are presented in that book. And then also near and dear to my heart was this last one that they found that teacher expertise and judgment are just as important as the model or the approach or the text that are used. And Sam, you and I always come back to this. It, it's always about the teacher. It's always about the knowledge that the teacher brings of the field and of the children in front of the teacher that really makes a difference in the classroom. So just, you know, buying a set of decodable books or using a set of level text is not going to get the job done if the teacher okay. doesn't. In, uh, if you give me a moment to get on my soapbox for just a moment, and the soapbox goes something like this, uh, beginning with the first grade studies, okay, uh, through all uh, uh, through a whole ton of research over the years, overall, teachers overall make more difference than programs in terms of predicting how well the scores will be. That doesn't mean programs aren't important. Right. It just means that te that the real issue becomes how well informed and how uh, how much if you take away teachers tools, uh, you're taking away one of your most important things. So teachers make more difference than uh, programs. And that's my little two cents. Okay. And uh, that will always be true. No matter how the pendulum swings, that will always be true. Okay. Continue. Um, this one was from a blog, a very easy to read, read blog by Heidi Ann Messmer, who I love. I love her letter, um, I think it's called Letter Learning and First Words book. I love that book. Um, and so she wrote a blog called Fear Not the Decodable. So it was a pro-decodable article. She supports the use of decodables. But she has a final note in there that I thought was really important. Because I think this, I think a lot of people don't realize this. I don't think I realized this. But she says she believes, and she says, do you see the little one by the believe? She had a little note saying, I'm saying that this is my opinion. Um, that decodables are most useful when children are first learning to decode words and blend sounds together. And she says this period is usually two to three months. I mean, that that's not very long. When I think about how districts are buying all sets of decodables for all of kindergarten, all of first grade, all of second grade, they're planning to use them for years. So that stood out to me. Um, and she said, once they can easily blend CVC words, you know, short vowel words, which include digraphs and blends, you know, little bigger short vowel words, that they probably are ready to move on from decodables. Um, which again, I don't think a lot of people um, have thought that through. And she says, typically this point will occur in the spring of kindergarten or fall or winter of first grade. So okay. I think that's important when we think about, um, yeah, I think it's important to use decodables, but for how long and when, for who? Okay, and I did have the pleasure of interviewing her as well. And I'll, I'll put that uh, link in there. And uh, one of my, uh, well, I just think she is, uh, the two books that you mentioned are in the blog. So if people are interested, I'll tell you what, her two books are two that anytime I teach teachers about decoding, uh, they are two books that go at the very top of my list. If you don't have these two books in you know, some place in your building, you need to. So, uh, and readers will have a link to that. So uh, I am a huge fan of Heidi. I'm with you on that. And I saw that interview. Yeah. And then I'm going to mention Timothy Shanahan who writes a blog, um, and sometimes I might not like what he says, other times I do, that's not important. I always read it because he always addresses the issues that seem to be bubbling up the most. And he has a couple 
on decodables. And there's links to those in that one slide. But his takeaway from you know, what he's written and um, the research that he presents is that he would not give a child a steady diet of only decodables because research doesn't back that up. And he also would be careful about how decodable or how constrained the decodability is in those texts because and the, the point is if kids only have words in their books that they've had instruction in that phonics principle for, then they're not being exposed to anything beyond that. They are kind of at the mercy of the phonics program they're in. They're not gonna, may not learn more than just what they're being taught in those phonics lessons. And we know that children learn um, kind of on their own and pick some things up on their own if they're exposed to it. And it's called incidental learning. And that's kind of what he's talking about down here. And he says, constraining texts to match immediate pedagogical goals, like that's what your phonics program is teaching, may have long-term negative unintended consequences for students' word reading abilities. And we need to let them get a mental set for diversity or variety rather than them thinking that this is how reading works. Reading works by, you know, every word's gonna have follow a certain phonics pattern because that's not how reading works. Um, so I, I found his two blogs very informative as well. Um, and I would encourage anybody to go read those as well. Okay, and I'll, I'll also put in a plug for Reading Research Quarterly. He is the one that wrote the article around um, the whole business of um, what is, uh, oh dear, what is the science of reading? Okay, he wrote that, he wrote that article and it's the premier, in terms, for me, it's the article I'd go to when I want to find out what researchers think the mm -hmm. science of reading is, as opposed to what other people might think it is. Yeah. So he's kind of, uh, he's kind of like a gold standard. And once again, like you, I don't always agree with him, but I absolutely respect him. So he, uh, he's a big deal and uh, his voice should be resonating uh, with everyone uh, listening to this advice. So, uh, once again, I'm playing the reading research quarterly card. Okay, thank you. <laughs> and I think I just cover a, a couple more things. This book, and it's a very science of reading book. It's um, teaching reading source book, um, and I love it. I use it for my students at Miami because I think it's it really is honest about the research. And um, like we know in Florida and California. They are coming up with laws that say their books have to be like 70 to 80 percent decodable. And this book and other research tells us there is no research that says that. Like we don't really have any research that tells us how decodable a decodable book needs to be. And so for that reason, I think it's hard to even define decodable if you don't know how much of it needs to be decodable. Um, in this book, they say the majority of words should be decodable. So that's like 51%. But other states are pulling different numbers out of the air. And then they say also they need to contain high frequencies, words that turn into sight words, and they should be coherent and comprehensible. So, and I would add engaging. They need okay. to make sense. They need to be stories. Yeah. And you will make sure that there is a link to this exact book. Uh, that's a separate link so that people that are interested in it can get to it. Uh, yeah. By itself. Okay. And I think, let me just look, I think that may be all I want to talk about. Yeah, that's all I want to talk about really for the research. Um, I'll stop sharing for a minute in case we need to talk and then I can share again. Okay. Look at uh, yeah, that, that gives me a little place to put a, a mark in here because now, um, you, uh, you're going to talk about how you tell your teachers about how to evaluate a book, which is uh, the, the I think the core. Uh, I was blown away by all, all the things you said at LitCon. So if you, if a teacher is trying to evaluate a book, 
talk about good and bad decodables and how the lines sometimes get blurred and what you think the most important things are for teachers to take away when they're doing that. I will. So let me show you. I'm just going to skip. I'm not going to show all this. But um, typically we debate, should we use decodable text or should we use leveled books? Um, and I think both sides argue based on the worst representatives of both of those kind of books. So I'm going to show you what I was introduced to when I was first introduced to decodable books which was years ago, before any of this legislation started. I'd say it was probably 10 years ago. I signed up for the listserv called Spell Talk. Um, and it was all about science of reading back then. And these were the decodable books that I was introduced to and shown. And even just looking at this, you can see it looks like it doesn't make sense. It's got a weird picture. If you try to read it, it sounds like a tongue twister. Tot put 10 dots on Pat's rat. No, Tot. You know, it's just not engaging for children. And I think it's more confusing than anything else. So this is an example to me of decodable text that I would never choose to put in front of children. Um, but then you get to leveled text. And the issue with that is um, one side would say, well, they're all patterned and predictable. Like you can just, if you know what the pattern of the sentence is, you look at the picture, you guess the last word, you don't even have to read. Um, and I think both of those arguments are wrong because I'm gonna show you some leveled books that are nothing like this. And I'm gonna show you some decodable books that are nothing like this. I think there are excellent books that just happen to be labeled decodable or leveled, um, and yet they hold the same good characteristics that we want teachers to know about. Okay. So with my so, students, go ahead, Sam. Oh, okay. oh, so we've just looked at the good, the bad, <laughs> and yep. we're about to take a look at the good. Yeah. So here, this, this uh, um, decodable book taken, it's from a program called Being a Reader. And, you know, what I do with my students once they've learned all the phonics skills that have to be taught and they've learned about books, I ask them to look at books and kind of say, hmm, what skills do you think are supported in this text? So even just glancing at this, like you don't even have to really read it. You can just glance and go, okay, I see short vowels. I see some consonant blends and I see some high frequency words. So I can tell that this book would support students who, if you think about that phonics continuum, are learning about short vowels and how to use some consonant blends and how to learn some high frequency words. Okay, I want to clarify that you're talking, when you said having students look at this, you mean you're teaching- My, my Miami students. Right, your Miami my, students. I'll call them pre-service teachers. Oh, my okay. pre-service teacher. So a pre-service teacher looking at this would get that and then uh, take it from there. So, and, and then oh, well, I just wanted to make that clear. That you, Thank you for clarifying yeah, that. Yeah, that you, is you wouldn't want a little first grader trying to figure that out, but you no, no, no. certainly so this is their teacher. How I'm trying to that. help. Yeah, I'm trying to help my pre-service teachers have the professional knowledge to be able to evaluate books on their own. Okay. Um, again, it's all about teacher expertise. But then again, if you think about the other factors we need to look at, is it engaging? Well, right away, it's got a beautiful illustration. The language is easy to read. You know, she naps a lot, but must come out for water. She sniffs. There isn't much to snack on. It sounds great. So here's a decodable book that is written in a beautiful way with natural language that I would love to use this with any, you know, any of my students who were at this point in their literacy development. Um, Here's a, here's a bad example of a leveled book. And I used this. So I own up to this <laughs> back in the day. I think <laughs> I might have too, uh, but I'm not going to admit to it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. We did have leveled books that stayed patterned way too long. And here's one of them. And this was not a low level. This wasn't for, you know, a very, very beginning reader. This was later in their program, but it's just completely patterned. 
it's just kind of, I don't want to say silly, but kind of is. I don't think it's that engaging. And all you have to do is look at each page and count monkeys. So again, I own this. This is some of the books that we used back in the early 90s, um, but they're not all like this. And this is where I'm going to show, you know, here's a, here's a good one. You can look at this and see, oh, we must be learning about vowel teams <laughs> and our controlled vowels because you see them there and some high frequency words. And then I want to show you, and let me just show you another one. I'm going to stop sharing and then I'll go back to that. Um, I've got two books here that are um, both leveled. These are leveled books from a leveled intervention. But when I open them up, and for the first place, this is, they're both nonfiction books. They're informational text. And if I open it up and show you the text. You can uh, see yeah, uh, yeah, I can see it now. Good. Yep. You can, again, look at this. And I'll just let you look for a second, Sam. Okay. And I won't put you on the spot, but... If you're a phonics teacher like I am, you would see right away long vowels and R controlled vowels. So I see AI, I see EE, -E, I see silent E, several examples of it. Almost every word on this page is decodable or a high frequency word. Like I think they all are, to tell you the truth. And this is a leveled book. So my point being, Putting a label on something can give somebody the very wrong impression about what they're going to find inside. When I work with my students, and I'll just show you an activity that we do. Um, and this is from Nell Duke's textproject.org site where she has resources um, for parents, teachers, children. She has decodable books that you can download. But I just pulled one and I was having students look through some books and decide what phonics principles would I be able to support and give my students practice in if I used this book. And I have them go through and identify those things. So are there words that would be decodable by a student who was in the long vowel, you know, part of the phonics continuum. And they go through and they box those words. And then I ask, are there high frequency words? And they underline those words. Um, and then they might, I might say, are there any content words that are just in the story to tell the story, like the word elephant? I don't care if kids can't sound that out. Um, that doesn't mean I'm never going to have a story about an elephant just because it doesn't follow the phonics patterns that they're in. So that I just kind of have students do that so that they learn, like I've done this for so long. When I open up a book that I'm going to use to teach, I am immediately evaluating it like this. Do I see the high frequency words that they know? Do I see the phonics skills that I want them to talk, to um, practice? And is it engaging and does it have natural language? And once you do that, once you start evaluating books that way, I think you can't go wrong. I think you're always going to choose good books that help students, you know, progress in their reading as opposed to just like, I think you've even mentioned it, Sam, how if you've got leveled books, you might just say, oh, I know they're in a G. I'm just going to go pick a G. Have you experienced yeah. that? That is my nightmare. Okay, and and so when teaching about this, uh, you know, and, and there were many teachers learned to do it that way. Oh, all you have to do is walk in and get the right level book, get it off. Well, okay, for me, my mantra was always, okay, what work are you leaving for the child, and why? If you can tell me that, then I'm fine with you using that book. If you can't, then you really better take another look at that book and see what it is that you're going to use it for in the way of your teaching. What word work are you leaving them and why? If you leave too much work for them, you'll have them frustrated. And if you do all the work for them, you'll have them helpless. If you want to have them learning, you've got to pick a book that lets you have a good answer to that question. So when I taught this back in the day, 
uh, to my teachers, that's that was the mantra. That was my mantra. That was my question. What work are you leaving for these kids and why? And if you've got a good answer for that, then my prediction is you're going to have a pretty good lesson plan. And you know what, Sam, the only way that a teacher would have an answer to that is if they'd gone through and evaluated the book just like this. So it, it just all fits perfectly together. Well, that's why I was born. I was just thinking, where were you when I was teaching this? I, I wish I had had your methods to add to what I was doing. So, okay, I don't, don't let me interrupt. Go. Well, I just wanted to kind of close. We're running out of time. Um, that from all these different sources and research studies and all the authors that I've been reading, these are the criteria that kind of have bubbled up to the surface for me. Um, to think about when you're selecting books. Does it have an engaging story? If it doesn't, we're losing kids. I'm sorry, I just think we are. Does it have natural language? Because print is written language. It, it should sound like natural language. Are there high frequency words that kids know by sight to aid fluency? And then do they have decoding opportunities that match their skill set and what they need to learn? Um, so I listed some of the um, researchers and authors down below there that I've read to help inform, you know, my thinking on this at any rate. Okay. And th th this particular slide will have a big place in, in the uh, uh, blog that I write about this. I, I think this is the heart of what you were have been talking about. And if teachers can know these things about the book, then they're going to be able to do a good answer to that question. What work are you leaving for the kids and why? So yeah. this is like, this is like everybody put a big star on this one. Uh, this is a big takeaway. Thank you. All right. I'll stop sharing there. <laughs> okay. There, there are so many more things we could talk about, uh, but as you're pointing out, we're, uh, we're, we're starting to run out of time. Uh, and when that happens, what I usually say is this, is there any, oh my gosh, how could I let this interview go by without bringing this up? Is there anything like, like that left? And if there is, speak now or forever. <laughs> okay. Um, two things. One's a, one's a detail-y thing and one's a kind of big global thing. The detail-y thing was I did mean to mention um, that... I feel like there's a place for, I showed you a patterned text, but I like to jump, I like to swim, I like to run. Um, don't throw those away. I think those are important to use for children who don't know how to match one-to-one. -one. They don't know the concept of a word. They don't understand that one spoken word equals one printed word. They don't have that concept down, concept of word. And those patterned books are perfect for that because these kids can't decode yet. They don't know anything about that, but we do have to get concept of word going. And if they if they know what it's going to say, they can point and match and practice. So don't throw those away. Just don't use it. Once they can do that, they don't need to read those anymore. Um, the other thing I would just say is, and it kind of comes back to what we've been talking about and the importance of teacher expertise. I think like I'm worried about what's happening in Ohio because laws are being passed that teachers don't really have any control over like lawmakers are telling teachers what books they can use and how they're supposed to teach um but if we have enough teachers with enough knowledge i think we can inform legislators better than we have i don't think they completely understand the issues and hopefully get better laws passed or allow more autonomy for teachers and districts to teach the way they know best, um, because typically they're the ones who know the research best, better than lawmakers. So I would just say my message to teachers would be, read the research, learn what it really says, and then speak out. Um, we have to inform people, or we could end up with some laws that just, they don't match what the research says. So that would be my... Well, so well put. and. Uh... It, you, my other mantra, of course, uh, anyone that's read me knows, is use all the research. And, and by the way, uh, one of the things that I got taken aback by early on is when Nel, Nel Dude said, you know, if the research is supporting what you're doing, 
stop doing it. <laughs> okay. And, so, uh, and, yeah, I meant to mention in my introduction, I I emphasized my reading recovery, which has been hugely important to me and the most like I value it more than anything. But I'm also trained in Orton Gillingham. <laughs> I'm also trained. I've had other extensive training in science of reading. I'm trained in foundations. So I come at it from um, not one single perspective, which I think is important. So I, I feel like it's a good idea for all teachers to have kind of trainings in different theory bases um, so that they're looking at exactly what you said, all the research. Look at all the research. Okay, and since I mentioned Duke specifically, uh, that's kind of a paraphrase in my take on what I got from her. Uh, yeah, yeah. That the uh, you know, uh, folks, there there are some practices that we, you're just going to have to, spill. as you've said, yeah. uh, you don't do that. Well, you don't use those anymore. Uh, yeah. And there's always new things to learn. Well, this has just been delightful and informative. Uh, you're a teacher of teachers, and I can tell that. Uh, you've got some terrific ideas, and I, I'm very, very happy that you shared them. Uh, now we're down to that last moment in a Bomberito interview where we do something just a little silly. We give ourselves a giant smile, and we do a Zoom wave goodbye. Bye. Bye. And thank you so much for joining us. Bye-bye.